This session is about the aftermath of the Chevron Red Butte Creek spills. So we're going to hear from the, one of the PHMS engineers who was integral in looking at what happened here, um, and then uh, the Public Works Director, uh, who played a significant part too, and then some people that, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, from the 30,000 foot view, the city of Salt Lake City did some amazing things that you don't see happen anywhere else. You know, they formed this ombudsman position to help people deal with the tragedy. They brought in outside experts to look at things independently. The other thing they did is they formed an oil spill work group uh, of citizens and involved people to take a look at what happened and make recommendations. That's something I haven't seen very many other communities do, and we're going to hear from a couple of people that were on part of that. So first up is David Mulligan, who's a senior engineer here in the western region for the U.S. Department of Transportation, PHMSA. Hi. Hi, I'm uh, Dave Mulligan. I'm out of the uh, western region with PHMSA. And uh, that map that Linda showed with all the pipelines, with gas and liquid pipelines, uh, it's part of, uh, I'm one of the 110, is it, Linda, with the uh, number of inspectors. So I, I see a lot of windshield time and uh, travel a lot throughout the West uh, looking at inspection records and making sure they do comply with the safety regulations. Uh, Carl, are you going to put this up on a website that they can download these presentations? Okay. So here's my uh, contact information. Chevron pipeline releases. Two of them. This is a map of the, uh, the crude system route. As you can see, they collect crude oil in Rangeley, Colorado, and it's shipped through a 10 inch pipeline um, all the way to Salt Lake City Refinery. Uh, the one map on the right is uh, where it goes through, I think there's the amphitheater is right here, and here's Red Butte Creek right in here. So I just wanted to give everyone an overview of the locations we're looking at. Release number one of the crew. So on June 11, 2010, um, we are release detected. Um, odor call from a local fire department. Uh, Chevron did not detect the release initially. Um, so when they got that call, they sent out people to go looking uh, you know, where the pressure drops were and everything. The leak location was discovered about 50 yards upstream of Red Butte Creek, uh, right in kind of a walking path just uh, south of that, uh, of the creek. Approximately 750 barrels were released and spilled into Red Butte Creek, flowing down into, um, I think it's called City Park Lake. I'm not sure the terminology, Liberty but Park. Liberty Park, okay. FIMSA actions. So once we were called out uh, going through the investigations, uh, we, we confirmed the cause was from an electrical arc, uh, a fault on the transmission line uh, that went, you know, basically when you're, when you're producing power and it's an AC fault, it's going to ground and it's getting back to its source. Pipeline was there, pipeline metallic, least uh, path of resistance, so it jumped on the pipeline. Um, we reviewed the 2008 inline inspection record. So when there's an accident, we send a, uh, there's a tool that we use or the operator we have used. It's called an inline inspection. It's, uh, we call it a smart pig. Basically, they send it down the pipeline. It collects data. It collects metal loss data. It can look at welds. It can calculate any corrosion that was, uh, uh, that was done in uh, metal loss. So we looked at that data, make sure that the rest of the pipeline was not damaged. And, and if we did see damage, that we had them go out and correct those deficiencies. Look for other power sources. So similar uh, situations where a fence post, this situation was a fence post on top of the pipeline, installed after the pipeline was there. Uh, within 12 inches, and that's where the arc jumped across. Um, we observed re repair of leak site and damaged pipes. So where they had that uh, pinhole, we observed uh, that repair, and also the um, there was a in the 
Butte Creek Valve Vault, there was a, also an arcing in there. And then also to uh, integrity test that pipeline, they put a pressure test on it, and they hold that pressure test for four hours. Compliance order. So this is a compliance order. After the first release, we said, look, Chevron, we gave them a civil penalty that they paid on December 1st, 2010, 423000 Uh The next items, it's missing one. So we had them clear the right away and also look at other areas where this could happen. Um, and then the last one was Oh, their leak detection system. Most important one is down here. It's their, uh, <clears throat> modify their leak detection system. It took them 10 hours to respond to this incident. Um, and when somebody else calls and they, they didn't know about it, that's uh, unexcusable. So the leak detection system was uh, primary. <laughs> Just some pictures going through. Um, I don't know if anyone's seen all these. This is Red Butte Creek area. This is um, over here is the fence area. You can see the pipeline marker here. And this is the, basically what happens is there are some overhead transmission lines, power transmission lines. It goes through pod heads here for an underground cable that goes behind this Williams building and then jumps up above ground again to go to high power transmission lines. This is where the fault occurred. And you can see this fence post, it's hard to see in this drawing, but this fence post within 12 inches of that pipeline is where the leak occurred. This is the, um, the pinhole leak. Normally when you see a round symmetrical uh, pitting like that, it is uh, usually AC induced, uh, uh, induced fall current. If it was general corrosion, you'd see abnormal pitting in the area and, and leaks through that. Just another uh, picture of the size of the, uh, so it was a dime size hole. Okay, going through release number two. Um, this was an unfortunate incident. It was uh, something that they didn't follow their procedures. After they did the hydro test, so they did an integrity test after the first leak, they held that test for four hours, they filled it with water. They drained that water down. That was in the summer. This was in the winter, December. So we all know what happens through freezing water pipes. It's when it freezes and thaws that it expands. <clears throat> Just going through the, uh, the sequence of events, December 1st, 1154, Chevron notified the NRC, National Response Center, which uh, notifies all the sub-agencies. The original spill estimate was 100 barrels of crude oil. Uh, initial contact, so we called Chevron back at 4.30 a.m. That, uh, that next morning. Uh, how they noticed it, their leak detection system caught this. They noticed a short on their 10-inch crude line, which basically says what they put in one end of the line didn't come out the other. Something's wrong. Uh, Chevron personnel were dispatched and they found the release 100 yards from the June 1st incident. This happened at the Red Butte Creek valve site. It did not get into Red Butte Creek uh, this time. Their response was, uh, um, you know, within time that they could get that. Uh, just kind of a timeline of what they went through. Controllers detected the leak at 8.30 p.m. That was when they were in and out. They were measuring the volumes and it didn't match. Leak was found when they sent out their crews looking for it at 11.15. It was the leak source confirmed that it was a frozen valve. So they didn't get a water out of that valve. It froze. And when it thawed out, that's when it uh, expanded. So. That valve assembly was removed and it was sent to a metallurgical analysis lab. Um, they updated their spill estimate 
to 500 barrels of oil. Uh, FINSA action. So this is after Chevron went out and we showed up on site and we started looking at the scene. We reviewed the metallurgical test results of the failed valve, uh, the operation and maintenance records. This was key. This was them not dewatering their systems and winterizing their valves. Even though they had a procedure, um, they didn't follow that procedure precisely. They buttoned down on that procedure now. Same thing, examined valves on the system. So they went through every valve on that system to make sure they were winterized. They didn't make the same mistake. Um, we did take June's bill enforcement action for this, and I'll go through some, some of those actions that, uh, and an update on those actions. Identified noncompliances, mandated corrections. So this will be something uh, we'll go through. We issued a compliance order dated uh, December 8, 2010. So that was approximately seven days after the spill. Uh, <coughs> these compliance orders, or these, uh, it went into in reference of items. So item one, we had them submit a restart plan before they, uh, before they started back up again. That's been completed. We went through that plan and made sure every step was taken to identify any deficiencies, make sure that they had manned when they started back up, that they manned all the uh, above ground stations, uh, and, and they had all that in place before they started up. We approved the restart plan, and the pipeline was back in service on June 21st. Item three, during that startup time, we had Chevron have personnel along that pipeline for 48 hours continuously to make sure that there was nothing going, uh, that there were no leaks occurring, any pinhole leaks that they could not detect on their leak detection system. Uh, we wanted to know about it right away. And then after that 48 hours, we had them do daily patrols on that line <coughs> within the Salt Lake City Valley. <coughs> After a complete full metallurgical examination, uh, it was, we got the fa failure analysis back from that valve and it was a freezing valve. So the bonnet on that valve, they just didn't get all the water out of it. Um, so it was, it was an error in terms of following their process. Another important one at the bottom that's cut off up here is the uh, item five. It was provide appropriate leak detection systems for the, uh, for the pipeline from Hanna Station to Salt Lake City Refinery. Uh, next item is submitted integrity verification remedial work plan. This is ongoing. This is something that uh, basically after they ran that inline inspection device, gathered all that data, they corrected any of those problems that they saw in that tool, in that data, any metal loss, is that they have to supply some other things to us and, and they're working on that right now. Uh, the integrity of the pipeline, we have been assured and, and looked at their data that they're operating within, uh, within spec. Uh, the valve study with additional valves uh, one of the items was to work with the state and uh, city and local, um, local municipalities on a valve study, where valves would make sense to place on that system to kind of contain anything that did happen. Uh, this was completed. I know I've worked with uh, Jeff and, and, and some other team on the Provo River uh, Water District Association, and we've had a lot of good discussion. Uh, some of these are, anytime you cut into the line to put a valve in or anything that comes up above ground, it is another area of concern. Um, just as we saw from that second spill, there's a flange, there's a, a bolt, there's uh, something that could be vandalized or anything like that. So we wanted to take that into account that, you know, we didn't, have them put in valves, you know, every hundred yards or every mile. Um, 
and, and what those, the purpose of those valves, how they can mitigate their, uh, their spill plan. This is the, uh, a picture of the second release. And as you can see, this is where the leak occurred. So this is on line number two, a 10 inch line that's in service. Line one is over here and it's out of service in mothball. Uh, this is the motor operator, so they can remotely activate this valve. But this is where the water was trapped and leaking. Just a close up of, uh, of where that leak occurred. This right here is a tee off that they use to inject water for that test. So the hydro test is. This is where they injected the pipeline with that water and tested it and pressured it up. This is actually where the leak occurred. So the oil was seen coming out of this, this bonnet, this valve bonnet. Uh, remaining work left to be done to close this uh, corrective action order. Uh, there's one area of concern, the Provo River crossing near Diamond Bar X Ranch. Uh, that is supposed to, uh, it's scheduled to be remediated in the summer of this year. They did do some uh, remediation work in working with the Provo River Water Association on a temporary embankment. But this is the long-term solution in terms of, uh, and I know they're working with the landowner trying to, uh, to work out what, what the best solution is there. This concern is the runoff during spring runoff, this Provo River gets, uh, gets going pretty good. So the flow rate is, it exceeds um, normal flow. And they're, where their pipeline crosses that, it, the bank is eroding kind of right there. So they want to get that under uh, depth of cover. We require a depth of cover of four feet in rivers when it's constructed. This pipeline was constructed in the 50s. Mountain Dell and Little Dell Reservoirs, where Chevron's pipeline runs down, uh, runs down that hill. I know Jeff, we've been working together. This, Chevron proposed some valves in there, but there may be a little better scenario in terms of uh, you know, what the study will supply. So what they're doing is they're contracting to a uh, uh, consulting firm, Bowen uh, Collins and Associates, to perform more studies out there. What we're trying to do is protect any of the water sources if there ever was a spill there. This line, um, it's mostly protected. There's, it's not open to the public in that area, but it's, you know, if there was a spill, how do we protect the water sources? Uh, they're relocating the valve set that I showed in a previous slide. They're relocating that valve upstream on the other side of the creek. I think a lot of us had a question about why did you put a valve downstream after, you know, after it crossed the creek? Um, it, you got to remember this was built in the, in the 50s, and I think during that time what they have told us is that they were protecting Fort Douglas. Uh, before the university got there or anything. Now they're, uh, they're getting permitting. This is scheduled to happen later this, uh, this summer to move this valve. That's why you can still see some temporary uh, things around that valve set and you can see where the new site they're gonna place it. Uh, they still have remaining a motor operated valve at milepost 138 and two check valves at uh, a check valve also at that mile post and one at uh, mile post 147. So everything in pipelines goes by mile post from where it began to where it's uh, downstream. Also, there's a uh, pre-installed tap to re they, uh, they still need to do. It's kind of at the bottom. It is a drain down tap, so if anything happens, they need to suck that crude back out of the line before it gets into the environment. And that's at the Weber uh, Diversion Canal. Here's just a list of the valves that have completed and what they still need to, uh, to complete. Uh, so they've completed four of the, uh, four of the valve items. 
Uh, they've added a motor operator valve, which is remotely operated, so if anything, they do see pressure differentials, they can shut that down. Um, they do have two, uh, one block valve left to install with the motor operator and two check valves. Leak detection improvements. After the uh, first spill, so it took them 10 hours to notice that spill, the fire department called them and that's when they sent out people. What, they, what they've done, this, this is a big improvement. So the hourly log sheets, uh, volumetric balance. This is saying we're gonna look at everything hourly, everything coming in and out, we're gonna make sure it balances. Um, so what comes in at Rangeley or what comes through Hannon Pike Station, we're gonna see what comes out at Salt Lake City. So they're gonna look at that hourly. They've also updated their, their software provider. So the algorithms that they use, also the sensors along that pipeline. In each one of those locations, they have pressure sensors and collecting data on those new valves. So that sends back a signal to their SCADA center that they can use in their, their model to, to, um, to balance that and they go through those algorithms to notice, hey, is everything looking okay? Uh, they've tightened down on that. System provides volume balance leak detection. Also external leak detection. Um, originally they were, you'll notice if you go out to these valve sites, they have cameras pointing down at these valves. Um, these cameras were originally supposed to be motion sensing cameras. Um, they've, they've had a lot of false alarms on those. So what their process is, is it's still 24 seven monitoring those locations so that they can keep an eye on any oil on the ground. Their process in their SCADA control center is that they have to look at those monitors every hour and check off to see if they see anything. Also, if they see anything come up on their, their, um, their hourly log sheets or their SCADA um, software, the pipeline, monitoring system, they can go to those locations and look, do I see anything on the ground? So it's a, it, it's a good tool to use. It's not, they're still working on the software to see if that motion function, they can get that working more reliably. There's nothing more distracting if it's a, they get a lot of false alarms and it's just human nature that if it's false alarms and it goes on for a long period of time, that people don't take those false alarms seriously. So they want to make sure when they do get an alarm, it works and it, they have to react. Batch operations, um, some of this, this is more of a training thing is, okay, how do we look at this? How are our, uh, our control room managers, uh, those controllers trained? How do they recognize a leak? How do they recognize the system of, of the uh, mass balancing? So this was um, the, their batch operations in terms of detecting any release on the pipeline or leak indication response protocols. Uh, once they do have an indication, first thing is, hey, we gotta shut it down, we gotta send people out there to look at it, rather than you know, looking at it, analyzing the data, shut it down without pumping against any, uh, any release. That's all I have in terms of, I don't know if that was 15 minutes, I probably went over. Oh, you got a clock here. 